everyone. Welcome to the National Museum of Singapore's Facebook live stream curator tour of the exhibition titled Home Truly, Growing Up with Singapore, 1950s to the Present. My name is Wong Lee Min. I'm one of the curators for this show. We are really delighted to have you here with us. So let me just start by telling you a bit more about Home Truly before we walk into the gallery. Home Truly basically captures the key experiences as well as moments that speak to who we are as Singapore and as Singaporeans. It captures some of the happy moments as well as the tensions, the sad moments um, that speak to who we are. Right. And um, for today, we are very delighted to have with us two special guests and we will tell you more about them when you meet them later on. They will be able to speak more about the photographs in which they are featured or in which they contributed to the exhibition. Now, Home Truly is open to you 3rd October, uh, 3rd October this year and is open daily from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. The last admission being at 6.30 p.m. So if you have not yet visited us, please do so quickly. All right, let's go in. Right, so at the entrance of the exhibition, you should be getting one of these multifunctional pens that you see me holding over here. This multifunctional pen allows you to write with the tip and also there's a stylus for you to use um, the touch screens and more importantly right there is this tag it is an rfid tag and you should use it to interact with the exhibits in this exhibition so once you enter do register using the kiosk here and you're good to start all right so we are now at the first section of the home truly exhibition well, um, the curatorial concept for home truly really dives into what a home is. So we thought that, well, some people would say in order to have a home, you need to start first with a physical space. And that is why for the very first section of our exhibition, we titled it Laying the Foundations, which is what you need when you are building a physical home. In this section, we cover various nation building policies, such as defense, um, industrialization, building the nation, right, um, leading on to our independence, so on and so forth. However, despite covering nation building policies, what we are doing is to cover it from the ground up level. So we are looking at how people experience these policies in their everyday life. So if you just look behind me, right, what you see here are photographs from the 1959 election, the very first election in Singapore where voting was made compulsory. And so you see that here what we have is a group of uh, Ma Jie, right, Amas, who are queuing up outside the Guangzhou Hui Guan to cast their vote. Yep, and you can take a look at the electrifying atmosphere at the political rallies back in those days, right? Um, yeah, and uh, so let me show you how to use the RFID tag so that when you come over to our exhibition, uh, you'll get a better sense of it and get to try it for yourself. So um, what we have done with this exhibition is really to incorporate people's voices. And we have done this through plowing through oral history interviews from the National Archives as well as um, through engagement sessions. Right, so um, I've, uh, you, you should have had some time to read this quote over here. You can tell that it is from a um, National Archives of Singapore history interview. Right, and what you have to do with this RFID is simply to tap on whichever response that you agree with more. And at the end of the entire experience um, in this exhibition, when you check out, you will get a, a result on what home means to you. Is it about people, places or experiences? All right, so now let me show you some of the artifacts um, that came from the 1959 election. So here we have right, um, an election pamphlet from our founding prime minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. And in the middle, we have a um, polling card right, for the 1959 Legislative Assembly election. And at the bottom, we have an election pamphlet from the Singapore People's Alliance. Back um, in the 1950s, before 1959, 
the Singapore People's Alliance was the ruling party. And this man, Mr. Lim Yew Hock, that you see here, was Singapore's um, first chief minister. Right. So let's take a look on the other side of the pamphlet. Right. So what's interesting about these pamphlets is that on the other side of uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's PAP pamphlet, um, it lists in Chinese a lot of his academic credentials as well as um, the work that he has been doing in the unions. Right. Uh, so it is a very worthy artifact. But when you look at the SPA, if you compare it to the Singapore People's Alliance um, election pamphlet, you will see that this is instead a very visual pamphlet. And what they are trying to say is that um, if you vote for the PAP, right, that will cause your iron rice bowl to um, be broken. But if you vote for the SPA, uh, you can be assured of freedom and that your rice bowl will always be full. So it is interesting to take a look at how these two political parties spoke to the public, one going for um, more, more words and more text about credentials and the other um, just going for a, a more simple visual kind of um, strategy. Right, so moving on. So this um, subsection of the very first part of our exhibition covers our road to independence. And I would like to direct your attention to this card over here. This is the first day cover and if you take a look at the date, right, it's the first day cover of our National Day. But there's something interesting about the date. Because for most of us, uh, we take 9th of August as our National Day. But you would see over here that it says 3rd June 1961. Right, so what um, happened here is that in fact, 3rd June 1959 was the day that Singapore gained its full internal self government and um, it was also the date that we celebrated as our national day until a um, merger in 1963 after which we celebrated Malaysia Day and after we um, separated from Malaysia then we took 9th of August as our national day. Right, let's take a look now at another photograph. Right, this is the photograph that um, we would be spending some time to look at and what it shows is um, land, uh, it, it shows um, land rovers fitted with um, the L6 weapon of magnesium battalion anti-tank. So um, short, in short, it's known as a wombat. And um, basically, this shows the mobile column, the very first mobile column presented at the National Day Parade back in 1969. This photograph here was contributed by Mr. Rod Travascus um, from the UK and today he is back in the UK. So Mr. Travascus um, spoke to us about this photograph and he shared that um, in the 1960s, right, he was posted um, to Singapore where he served um, in the, one of the high frequency radio stations um, as part of the Royal Air Force. And being into photography since he was a teenager, he used to walk around Singapore um, with his Pentax camera and that's when he took this photograph. And because he was also a military chap, he said that he was naturally interested in how um, Singapore was developing its military, uh, which was in very early days back then in 1969. Right, and so another interesting thing that Mr. Travasco shared with us was that um, he used to develop the photographs in his own bathroom. So he converted his bathroom into a dark room and that was where he developed the photographs from film. Okay, right. So, um, well, if you listen out, right, you would hear that there is actually a soundscape that plays in the background of this section of the exhibition. This soundscape is called A Day in the Life of Singapore and it is a specially curated soundscape, right, um, that uh, we commissioned for this exhibition. What we hope to do is to capture the characteristic sounds of Singapore, right? Um, so you will hear things like um, sweeping sounds, right? And you should probably be hearing some NS boys do um, their cheer while they are training in the morning now, right? Uh, okay, so now let's move on. Since we are on the topic of NS, let's take a look at the National Service. So this 
is the section on the National Service, right? And what we have here are, are a series of photographs showing the process, right, of um, se sending off by the family, saying bye to the family, to doing, um, uh, to, to listening to the officer, right? And then doing the medical checkup. And of course, um, this scene of um, the, the NS um, conscripts needing to um, shave their heads, Right, uh, I think the expression of the two boys here says it all. <laughs> right, and finally, good news, right? Um, the passing out parade. We also have with us here some artifacts from um, the first batch of National Service men. We have a core up notice, that is the pink card that you see on the left. And we also have the water bottle, the mess tin, as well as the helmet. Right, and these um, items, as mentioned earlier, come from the first batch of National Service men. We have there a pager as well. So some of you might remember in the good old days before we had handphones, pagers were the way to communicate. And many NS boys would join a long queue to the public phone, uh, pay phone, 10 cents, right? And, um, to, and they would um, use their pager to, to, to find out who has been trying to call them and they would return the call at the end of the day after the training. Well, now, if I could just come back to this photograph, right? Uh, this photograph is a photograph that attracts a lot of attention, right? Because everyone's wondering like, oh, who's this, who's this boy? What was he thinking at that point in time when he was conscripted uh, into the National Service? And he was part of the first batch, right? In 1967 to be conscripted into the National Service. So today I am extremely pleased to have with me Mr. Uh, Albel Singh. Right, and he is none other than uh, yeah, the, the gentleman standing in the photograph, right? That's right. Yeah, yes. hi, Mr. Singh. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Let's say hi to um, hi the viewers. Everybody. Hi, everyone. So, uh, Mr. Singh, could you please tell everyone more about yourself? Okay, uh, in 67, I was one of the first one to register for national service. Uh, it was in March 1967. And within five, six months, by August, we were already enlisted and started our national service duties. Uh, what happened on the first day when we went in for registration was this. Uh, we had to go through a medical checkup. And uh, what was really embarrassing was, you know, you'd have to strip down, and it was like an open concept. Everybody can see everybody. And, um, you know, and there were ladies who were doing paperwork down there to enlist us and all. So it's, it was quite an embarrassing thing. But uh, it was something that we did chest measurement, height measurement, they check our teeth, they do a full body check, and just to make sure that we would be fit enough to do national service. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Mr. Singh. Could you tell us a bit more about how it felt like to be one of the first few, right, to be in the very first batch <laughs> of the national service? Yeah. I think the, the biggest challenge was really we were going in blind. We didn't know, there was no uh, example of what national service was all about. No one had gone through this whole process. Uh, so we were like guinea pigs going to the slaughter. But the good point was that there was no uh, bad stories to frighten you, you know. You went in without any fear or anything. You just went in there, just blind, not sure what's going to happen. So I think it was a, that was the balance. Overall, uh, we took each day as it came. And uh, physical fitness was the key, and which put a lot of people in my group uh, uh, under a lot of stress. I, being a sportsman, I didn't have very much problem with the fitness, but there were others who really struggled through the whole process. I think the second challenge that we faced was this about uh, having a wide range of education levels of the people doing national service. Uh, the highest level, when we first in, uh, in the were called up, were O-level boys. And the, the other extreme was no formal education. And my buddy uh, was a farmer from Lim Chu Kang, you know, and we were accommodated in HDB, blo HDB blocks, one room HDB blocks, which had been converted into barracks. So you actually end up with two persons sharing one bathroom, and you have to communicate with your buddy in terms of cleaning and maintaining the place and things like that. So that was an extremely challenging thing. It was comical at times, sign language to get things done. Okay, did you have to pick up any language in order to help with the communication? Uh, basically, simple Hokkien, 
uh, words you pick up because you, you learn from the, the person and you in turn teach him English and you, you know, along the way you pick up things. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, so Mr. Singh then stayed on in the SAF for the next 32 years, right? That's right. Yeah, yes. so could you tell us a bit more about your career in the SAF? Okay, uh, I did two years of, I was supposed to do two years of national service, but on the 23rd month of my service, I was commissioned as an officer. Uh, so automatically, service was extended. I ended up doing three years of national service and uh, was commissioned in the infantry but I decided to continue my career in the combat engineers. And uh, it was in the combat engineers that I signed on uh, until I retired. Uh, basically, I spent most of my time in the combat engineers, but the last 10 years of my service was teaching at the command and staff college. So that was really covering all senior officers who go on to command uh, battalions and things like that. Mm. So that experience really helped me in my subsequent uh, careers that I did. I spent two and a half years in Ministry of Home Affairs doing emergency planning. Uh, and then I spent another 13 years in Bintan Resorts. Uh, and I think that was a good, I, I gained good background skills, which allowed me to lead people from a different society altogether. Uh, in Indonesia, your workers were all Indonesians and your working culture is different from Singapore. So it's quite a challenge trying to do it, but having done national service, served in the SAF, and dealing with national servicemen, some of whom were not happy to do national service, you learn how to motivate people. So it was easier to sort of transit into civilian life and apply some of the things that I learned there. All right, yeah. could you tell us um, what motivated you to stay on with the SAF? Okay, there were actually two main things that really uh, influenced me uh, that we needed defense. One was the hanging of the Indonesian Marines uh, who bombed McDonald House in 1960. They were, they were in 64, but in 68 they were to be hung. And we were deployed at Changi Beach to prevent uh, uh, them to come in to rescue the, the Marines. Mm -hmm. And we had to actually have live rounds, live ammunition on the beaches of Changi to do this. So it's quite a challenging thing. As a 19 year old, uh, having live ammunition, going to deal with an enemy, it was something that you know stays in your mind for a long time. Uh, then after that, when I was an officer cadet, uh, main 13 riots happened. And we were deployed to maintain peace in Singapore. We were deployed in the Taising area. And we used to do our work at night. We'd be deployed in the evenings, spend the whole night out patrolling the streets and go back daytime to sleep. That again also highlighted the need for security forces to maintain peace and order in order to progress as a nation. All right, yeah, and uh, Mr. Singh, what, what do you think are the differences? Do you notice any differences in how the National Service has evolved since 67 when you joined and through your years of service in the SAF? I think one was education because uh, communication was difficult. So it's challenging to try and to communicate, trying to train people. Uh, today it becomes easier. I think more importantly was this equipment or equipment. We actually had uh, hand-me-down equipment. After the British withdrew, they left things behind, we started using them. So we are doing, making do with things that were already available. Uh, I think economically we couldn't afford a lot of things. So we actually was all these hand-me-downs that helped us to go through. So you can get equipment which is suited for the European, but an Asian is wearing it and we are smaller than the European. So you adjust, you've got big, big pouches, belts which uh, you have to really make additional holes so you can tighten them. So these are the challenges you face. I think today our forces, are, our soldiers are all equipped with made to order for our sizes. You know, equipment that fits them very well. It's comfortable, you can carry more weights, it's comfortable. It's also managed the heat problem, the type of clothing we wear. So I think that aspect is so much better. Uh, I think secondly is our soldiers are more educated. So we can have more sophisticated weapons. 
and which makes it easier to train. Uh, hence, I think it's possible to even shorten the national service time, uh, which happened because from two years, uh, two and a half years for officers, three years, it has come down now to two years, and even then you get discount if you're physically fit. So there's a lot of changes that have taken place. And I think the other thing is a threat. Early years, the threat was Vietnam War and all. There was a real threat of the militarily you need to do something. But I think today, this is sort of not so obvious. Though there are challenges, but they are not the military type of challenges. And national service is something that helps us to bind society together. Because you go in uh, different races, speak different languages, but we are thrown in together and we are thrown at the deep end of the pool. So you have to sort of uh, uh, adapt and uh, you work in the buddy system. So you rely on your buddy. He watches your back, he watches back. So you, bec you build these bonds which last for a long time. So I think it helps a lot in even multiracialism to try and keep this Singaporean spirit. It becomes like we as Singaporeans are defending Singapore and not as Indian, Malay, Chinese. I think that's really what has National Service has done. And today it's becoming very apparent because you can see it even during COVID, how our National Servicemen have come out to, in various fields, to do what needs to be done for the nation. nation. Right, yeah. yeah, thank you for that. And today, Mr. Singh remains a very active volunteer, right? Speaking to schools as well as um, national servicemen about defence. Could you tell us a bit more about your volunteer role? Okay. Uh, I'm actually a commitment to defence ambassador. And we go out and share our stories about national service with uh, school boys, school girls, uh, to young NS men, to other organisations. Telling them of what we went through what were the challenges we faced and how do we how we managed to go through that by improvisation, by using what was available uh, in for the sake of the country. So I think that is something that we do quite frequently. And I think it's necessary for people to understand uh, why national service happened. Because today people even question, do we need a national service? There's no threat why we run national service. So I think this is important. Because if they understand it happened before, it is something that happened again. And we use examples like World War II, when we were not defending ourselves. We had foreigners defending us, and we fell to the Japanese. But if we had to defend ourselves, I'm sure we would have done a much better job, because that was our, this is our home. All right. Yep. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Singh. Thank you. Yep. So um, to our viewers, uh, right, uh, I'm sure you must have a lot more questions for Mr. Singh. So at this point in time, I would like to encourage you to put in your questions to our platform Pigeon Ho Live and later on we will be able to take the questions at the end of this curator tour. Alright, thank you Mr. Singh. We'll thank see you, you again later you. on. Yes, thank you. Alright, so um, moving on to the next part of this exhibition, we can take a look at some photographs that have to do with the infrastructural development of Singapore. These two photographs, in fact, they show the Gotong Royong project in the 1960s and 70s where the community, they partnered the government in order to do infrastructural works in Singapore. So this, um, the larger photo that you see on the left, it shows um, polytechnic students being involved in um, road meddling. So they were trying to improve the condition of the road. And um, over here, right, um, this um, photograph shows more people Right, trying to um, remove silt from a drain right, to um, prevent the flooding conditions from getting worse. Well, more close to recent times, we have the introduction of the MRT to Singapore. The MRT um, started its operation in 1987, and um, on that day, on 7 November, people were very, very excited. They wanted to be among the first few to take the MRT. And we have a lovely couple over there, Mr. Chan Kian Guan and um, Judy Ao, taking the MRT train on the first day of its operations to get to the church for their wedding. 28 years later, in 2015, they were to take another photograph on the MRT. So it um, goes to show that the MRT train does connect in many ways. <laughs> Yeah, and so um, recently, just earlier this year, we put up a social media post on this photograph, right? And um, surprisingly, 
um, Madam Judy Ao, Mrs. Chan, she replied. So um, now all of us know that uh, it's a lovely family. They have two daughters who are married yeah, and they're waiting for their grandchild to come. <laughs> right, uh, so moving on, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about industrialization. Right, and this is where um, we have a uniform with us. This uniform is um, a worker's overalls from Rolai. And um, Rolai uh, is a German optical uh, company, right? Um, they, they made cameras as well as other optical instruments. And they were well known for the high precision engineering. And to have them in Singapore from 1971 to 1981 was indeed a huge boost to our engineering capabilities. So this coat over here, right, it belonged to uh, Mr. Chong Nam Soi, right? And uh, Mr. Chong, he donated the coat to us. And what we noticed rather interestingly were the stains on the coat. Yeah. So um, these stains on the coat, our um, colleagues from the Heritage Conservation Centre did some tests on these stains to find out what were inside, what were the things that were inside. And they found that there was um, high levels of titanium and sulphur. And these are elements that are often used in the camera manufacturing industry. There was also a high level of um, iron, and iron is a waste product of this manufacturing process. Okay, so this part is also about industrialization, and you see a lot more photographs, right, of, in the, uh, of people working in industries from the 50s all the way till present. And you also get a sense of how our industries have developed from more labor intensive. Um, work to more skills intensive work, for instance, um, biotech. Right, so over here, uh, we have done as part of the exhibition, a program known as the Students Archivist Project. So as part of the Student Archivist Project, the National Museum um, uh, trained students from the secondary level and tertiary level and um, asked them to go out to speak to seniors on industrialization. And we have here with us two stories from uh, Madam Chow Fong Fa and Madam Shirley Ong Yok Luan. And they spoke about their experiences working in factories. I think for um, Madam Chow's story, it was especially poignant because she shared about the industrial accidents that she witnessed when she was working in a plywood factory. Yeah, uh, so we would definitely encourage all of you to um, come down to the exhibition to listen to their stories because um, these stories really bring out how industrialization at that point in time um, brought women out of their traditional domestic roles into um, the, the outside working world. And um, that was a moment that brought a, uh, about a lot of social changes. All right, so uh, moving on to now the healthcare section. Right, and you see here many photographs of children taking vaccinations, crying because um, of the needles, right? Um, well, if we are to do the exhibition now, we would have added some photographs of the vaccination um, ongoing now for COVID-19. Yep, but when we were doing this exhibition, the vaccination drive was um, not yet underway. Yep. Uh, so um, the dental, I mean, the, the kind of dental hygiene lessons that we had in the past as well as in the day, it remains and always the children are very happy because um, they enjoy flicking water at their classmates. Right, and some of us would also remember the milk distribution in, in schools, right? And um, one of the pleasures that we have as curators um, putting together this exhibition is that many of these photographs, they remain within the living memory of people. So we have had um, the family members of this lady over here, a teacher. Um, so they came up, the family members came up to us saying that they recognized this lady, right? And um, she went on to be a very prominent educator, even becoming a principal of a school. Okay, yeah. and here we have the housing section. So just to point your attention to these three black and white photographs, you might be wondering, what has this got to do with housing? Isn't this a long conveyor belt with a lot of soil on it? So actually, this shows the land reclamation process 
uh, underway uh, at Marine Parade. So what happened were, was that the hills at Siglap as well as Bedok were being levered and the soil was then tr uh, transported with these long, huge conveyor belts to Marine Parade where the land is then filled in and here you see the first few HDB blocks sprouting at um, Marine Parade in the 1970s. So Marine Parade is the first HDB estate to be entirely built on reclaimed land. Here, for this photograph, what is interesting about it is that you see the transition. This is a family at Yunos um, living in a kampong house, a atap house, and they have yet to move to a HDB flat. But at the same time, you can see that there are HDB flats behind them, right? And people are starting to move away from the kampong way of life into HDB high-rise living. Yep. And so I've mentioned earlier, Ron, that um, for this exhibition, we make it a point to gain um, voices from the public. And so that's why you can see that um, there are many huge quotes throughout the entire exhibition. Right? And these quotes really give us a sense of how things felt like to people back then. Yeah. Right, so we are done with the first section of the exhibition. And if you look around, you will notice that this has a very built up structure. It looks as though it's a construction site. And the intent behind this is indeed to show that there were many activities happening at the time of our nation building. So moving on to our next part of the exhibition, this is called the moving in section. So after laying the foundations, right, after you have a physical home, it is time to move in. And this section, second section of the exhibition, then focuses on the kind of um, shared experiences, the kind of intangible um, uh, feelings that bring people together. And this here, this cubicle over here, right? The arrangement of this section is that we make a lot, uh, a number of vignettes showing um, how, how um, showing the situation of what we are trying to um, allude to. And here, the festival section, we have something that looks like a living room because the living room is where people usually go when they visit their friends and family during festivals. So for this part, what we show is really the multicultural festival landscape that we have. Right, and um, I mean, you can see that um, everyone's decked in their traditional costumes and you have a little girl who is um, eating a mooncake, hoping that her family does not notice. Yep. And when you come down to the physical exhibition, right, I would really encourage you to sit on the armchair, which is towards the right of the section. Right, I promise you that the armchair will not catapult you out of the gallery. Right, by sitting on it, you will trigger an audio input and um, you will get to hear a bit more about how it was like to celebrate a festival together with one's multiracial neighbours. Hey, the next vignette that we have here looks like a hawker centre. Yep, so here you get to take a look at how Singapore's hawker culture has been evolving Right, um, from the good old days uh, of in the 50s and 60s at the Sate Club and also the itinerant hawker, right, walking around HDB blocks. Right. Uh, till now, um, our hawker centres that we are very proud of and the multi-racial cuisine that we continue to enjoy. Um, again, I would encourage you to come down to the physical exhibition because this vignette has a very special effect special thing that we can't show you through the video. And that is when you come, right, do take a few deep breaths because you will find that the air here smells a little different. It will remind you of our hawker centres, right? And if you came earlier on, uh, you can come down again because the smell changes. So I'm trying to say um, a lot without saying a lot. So do come down and you can smell it for yourself. <laughs> right, and this section is about our schooling experience. This is where you will find many photographs of happy classmates gathered. Right, sports day, right, talk of war, class photos. On the right, we have SYF, 
right? Those of us from performing groups, you will remember that very clearly. Uh, let me point your attention to some artifacts that we have with us here. So on the right, there is a table. This table comes from the Mahabodhi Primary School in the 1960s. Right, so um, the interesting thing about this table is that there are two drawers, right? And our hypothesis is that there was probably a morning and an afternoon session and two students were sharing um, this desk, one in the morning session, one in the afternoon, and each kid would have used um, one of the drawers. Right, so this table over here is in a very well used condition. If we can zoom in over here, you see that there's a lot of ink. Right, so probably a, a poor student um, accidentally toppled the ink bottle back in those days when they still had to refill ink um, through that, those means. Right, so of course when we talk about school, right, there are, um, well, there are the fun times, right? The, uh, the times when we sing, times when we play the eraser game, we win games, right, win medals. Yep, uh, and also play with the kuti kuti. So what you see over here, it is rather unusual for a kuti kuti because it's not made of plastic, it's made of metal, and it's multicolor, and it's really big. So it is, in fact, three times the size of our normal kuti kuti. So the fun things aside, there was the dreaded part about being in school, right, which is taking examinations. We have here with us two um, report books, right? I'll talk about the one on the left, First. So this report book came from um, a student from Havelock School and the poor student um, didn't do too well. And back in those days, um, yeah, he even had the principal writing a comment telling him to basically buck up. Right. Um, and on the right, we have a report book from none other than um, our former president, Mr. Ong Ting Chong. He was Singapore's fifth president. Right, and the first one, first president to be elected. Yep. And so you see him very young over here, right? And uh, basically, uh, well, you don't get to see his results from this display, but um, the curators, we did manage to flip the pages and we can assure you that he did very, very, very well. Okay, yep. so um, for this part of the exhibition, right? You can tell that it's a mock-up of a tuck shop. Right, and over here, we encourage our visitors to ponder about some of the questions uh, about their schooling life. What they love about school, what did they not enjoy as much? Um, and as part of school, right, we always say the national pledge and sing the national anthem at the start of the day. So which line from Singapore's national pledge speaks the most to you? And um, the third question would be, what are the common experiences that you have had and do they bring people from different backgrounds together? Now let's take a look at some of the responses that we have received from our visitors. Right. This is definitely one of the favourite corners for the curators because um, at the end of the day, there are many interesting replies to look at. So in fact, this one looks very interesting. Right. So um, this visitor over here right, recalls hiding food from greedy friends and it's very well drawn, right? <laughs> yeah, and um, basically what we noticed here is that there are many lovely memories about um, being with friends, right? All the friendships that were made in school, right? So let's move on to the next vignette. So welcome to the National Stadium. We now have the track, right? We are standing on the track of the stadium. This section is about how Singapore is a sporting nation. Right, so um, drawing your attention closer to the artifacts, um, the photographs that we have, you will see the proud moment when Singapore, uh, the Singapore Lions, right, celebrated their Malaysia Cup victory, right, back in um, the 1990s. Right, another interesting thing that we have here is the Great Singapore Workout, which um, again started in the 1990s. Right, this was really popular in schools. If you were in school in the 1990s, you might remember doing this. And there were all these um, steps that you could follow. Okay. And moving on, now we have reached another vignette. And here, 
you'll see many, many television screens because um, we are looking at popular culture in Singapore and focusing on the introduction of um, television broadcasting to Singapore in 1963. Right. So if you take a closer look, you'll see that in the past, right, watching television was an extremely communal activity because televisions were expensive back then and not many people could afford a television. And therefore, people crowded to the community centres to watch television together. Or if you had a neighbour who was rich enough to afford a television, you would invite yourself into their home to watch television or just peek through the window to watch. Yeah. And um, the, um, this photograph over here shows the um, start, right? the inauguration of Television Singapore right, in um, 1963 outside Victoria um, Theatre. There were 15 televisions placed there and the crowds swarmed to watch right, the inauguration of Television Singapore. And there were more sets, more television sets that were made available across the 52 community centres in Singapore on that day so that people could watch uh, television to their heart's delight. So do come down and you'll get to catch some snippets of um, very well-loved shows in um, Singapore's local television. Right, and here we are at the recreational section of um, the moving in part of this exhibition. Right, so over here you'll catch, some of, you'll catch sight of some of the places that you probably frequented as part of your um, recreation and leisure activities. So if I may, right, um, yeah, uh, I could invite your attention to come here and take a look at some of the artifacts that we have, right, of um, Big Splash, of Jurong Bird Park, Hopa Villa, the National Library, right, where uh, many people went to study and um, not just achieve great results, but also met their other half, right? And we have um, the National Theatre, right, that used to be located at the foot of um, Fort Canning. And um, the National Theatre was also known as the People's Theatre because members of the public contributed to the building fund, right? And so this is an artifact showing the receipt that was issued. So now we move on to the third section of the exhibition, which is um, titled Living Together. In Living Together, in this section, we look at the tensions that we have to handle when we are living together, right? Um, things like um, uh, multiculturalism, how do we deal with it? Or um, keeping Singapore clean, right? So what are the, some of the campaigns that we had, be it cleaning or even the courtesy campaign? So um, let's look at the artifacts over here. These artifacts here all have to do with campaigns that we have had, be it um, keeping Singapore clean, the courtesy campaign, um, or language, right, um, speaking different languages, or um, saving water, right, more recently, Water Wally, or even the Sing Singapore um, uh, program that we had. So um, this artifact over here, this poster, is one of the artifacts that really caught the curator's eyes for our team. This is a recent donation from the Ministry of Education Heritage Centre, and it is a poster from 1958. It is the anti-spitting campaign, uh, which is one of the campaigns under a larger campaign known as the Mass Health Movement. What's really lovely about this visual, right, is that you can see all these accusatory fingers and they are labelled the people, right? Um, and they are pointing at the person who is spitting. So basically, they are telling you, do not spit, right? And it is done in an extremely visual way. Another photograph that um, we, we are often, that, we, that, that really caught our eye and which we often talk about during our curator tour is this photograph known as Moving Cargo at Singapore River that is right up there and we have blown it up. So this photograph is um, contributed by Mr. Ho Kwok Kin, today 82 years old, and he contributed this um, in response to the open call that we did for the exhibition 
early last year. Right, and so this photograph is interesting because it was taken using a colour slide. So it is not taken using film, but a colour slide, which helps to retain the colours. So Mr. Hall explained to us that the colours are, uh, can, can be preserved to up to 100 years with colour slides. And at this magnitude that we have blown up, that we have magnified the photograph to, right, we can see many, many details. And it's an extremely busy, bustling morning around 7 plus a.m. when Mr. Hall usually takes photographs. And you can see all the cranes at work um, uh, lifting the cargo off the, 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 the boats and bringing them into the store houses. Right. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the Singapore River, you would notice the building right at the end. And it is the Asian Civilizations Museum today. Right. Okay. So when we did up this section, we got to know about an extremely touching story about Mr. C. Kunalan, our former national sprinter and um, his wife. So they are a multi, they, they are, um, um, it's a mixed race marriage, right? Um, Mr. C. Kunalan and his wife, Madam Chong Yun In. What they had was that, um, in the, uh, on the day of their wedding, they had three ceremonies, right? A Hindu celebration in the morning, a Western style celebration in the afternoon, and in the evening, it was a Chinese dinner that they had. What is extremely interesting about their story, about their love story, is that um, they met each other and got married in um, the 60s. And at that point in time, there was once when they were out on a date. Um, in 1964, the racial riots broke out in Singapore that night and they did not know that there was a curfew, right? And they were driving and they were stopped by a police and the police asked them, where are you going? Do you know that there's a curfew, right? And it was um, Mr. Kunalan and uh, Madam Chong spoke to us and they said that it was extremely confusing for the police, right? To see an Indian man and a Chinese woman in a car. And it just so happened that their driver was a Malay man. So just in that car itself, you have the extremely multiracial makeup of Singapore. Okay, right, so moving on to the fourth section of our exhibition, we have titled this Open Doors, and this is where we feature seven profiles, seven videos that show the multiracial makeup of Singapore, as well as the different communities that make up Singapore, right? And you can tell that this area is made to resemble a void deck, and the reason is that the void deck is the meeting space for many people in the community. And that's, that's what we thought this section really showed, the different people coming to Singapore. We, uh, among the different profiles over here, I'll just highlight two of them. One of them is um, Raj. He is a foreign worker living in a dormitory. And he plays a part there in um, helping the new foreign workers adapt to life in Singapore. We also have another story of Ng Chu Ting, a Singaporean who is today living in London, and she holds she, she says that her Singapore passport is something that she holds to very dearly because it's the only document she has now that has her name in the right order that she's used to Ng Chu Ting instead of Chu Ting Ng. Okay, and here, in what look like the letter boxes at our void deck, these are postcards from the children of um, Gurkhas. So the Gurkhas, Right, they can bring their wives and their children uh, to Singapore to stay with them until the end of their service. So uh, the postcards that you see here are penned by uh, the children of the Gurkhas, right? and um, they speak very poignantly about the feelings that they have for Singapore and for their Singapore friends. And th these postcards were written uh, on the eve of their departure back to Nepal. Right, so um, the stories that are collected here really help us to think um, more deeply to understand more about the emotions of different people that call Singapore their home. Okay, so this brings me to the fifth section of the exhibition. This section is titled Sturdy Through Storms. And if you take a look around you, you will notice that there are all these rock-like structures because what we are trying to allude to in this section is that Singaporeans People in Singapore, we have often met crises in very resilient manner, 
right, just like rocks. So um, various crises are covered here. For instance, floods in the 1960s, right? And we also cover other things such as um, the haze. And moving on, I would like to now introduce um, another, another difficult moment in Singapore's history. And this happened in 1997. Right, um, with um, the crash of Silk Air Flight MI-185 in December. So we have here a number of photographs that covered um, the crash of um, MI-185. And today we also have with us um, Miss Chu Chui Hua, a, photo, a former photojournalist, and she was um, the one who captured this photograph as well. So, um, Ms. Chu, thank you very much for joining us here today. Excuse me. Yeah, could you start by introducing uh, yourself? Okay, um, Chu Chui Hua, fr former uh, photojournalist of the new paper. Uh, I was with the new paper for 28 years, from 1988 to 2016. So, uh, it's like uh, this. Silk Air Crash is one of the major event uh, disaster that we, I covered. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, maybe if we just take a look at this photograph, mm -hmm. could you tell us a bit more about um, what was happening uh, when, when you took this photograph? Okay. Uh, the Silk Air Crash happened in, uh, on 19 December. So, this was a um, uh, so called the condolence service on the 30th December, where it's like a few. 10 days after the so-called the, the crashes. So all the, I think all Singapore came together as a nation to come and give a support to the, those family members of the disease. So it really show a very good, uh, I mean, a nation supports. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, yeah, but I think as, as she said, like all Singapore sh shared their grief, like she said, yeah, yeah. Mm. So yeah. And during the so-called the crash, when I was there on the second day. So it's kind of bad because it's like uh, family members was coming to us, asking us all the questions that like where are the bodies, whatever. But it's, if you've never been to the site, the Musi River, you will never know how huge is the real river like. It's different from a Singapore River. So when, you go, when we arrived on the first day, first day it, was like, it was like, oh dear. It's like, how do we find the bodies. How do we get all the things back for the family members? So I salute those, those uh, divers, both from uh, Singapore and Indonesia. They came, the sea is, I mean the so-called river water is like very choppy, milky, you can't even see anything. So they got to feel using their bare hands to dig out all the so-called belongings from passport to any things, any bags. So uh, try to check whether is there any intact bodies. So it's kind of sad lah. I would like to apologize to the family members at then say when they ask me, say, where are the body? Do you see anything? So we have to tell them a white line lah. Because it's kind of cruel to break the news to them and say that no, we don't see any body, we just see like so-called body parts. So it's kind of sad. So at then we do not want to sort of break their heart and make them so we have to tell them a white lie, say, look, we don't see anything. So far, they're still searching for stuff, yeah. Right, so mm. that they retain a, a sense of hope. Yes, correct, so, yeah. Mm. Could, could you tell us a bit more? I mean, it is very difficult to cover this incident. So what would you say was the greatest challenge in covering this uh, incident? Okay, because we have to, okay, uh, to travel to the site, it takes us two hours of uh, bamboo right and two hours back so four hours really on the journey so and then we got a challenge uh, ch uh, with the timing that we have lived i mean giving us like maybe few two three hours to capture and the place are kind of huge so we said we got to move around in the kampong area where the village and then try to talk to those villagers where what they see during when the explosions or whatever and then we will move around and see any things that found, whether the um, box, the back box found or whatever. So we got a challenge with the timing. Uh, okay, it's like, uh, to and then every time, because we have to try to get everything settled by safe 
latest by 6 o'clock. Because the moment, even 6 o'clock, when we leave the place, it's like total darkness. We can't see, we are in a boat, a small little bun boat, we can't see each other kind. So the darkness. And then I think uh, we have to be very sensitive because with the family members, they are they're worried. I mean, they have hopes. So a lot of things that we say, we must be very extra careful so that we, won't, we don't want to like break their hope kind. Yeah. Mm. So, and then during, I mean, I mean, the timing, because we are, we are on our own, like me and my colleagues, Melvin Singh, is like we are alone in uh, another country, like so called uh, unfamiliar places. Never been to Palembang. Where is Palembang? Kind. So, but we are, we are just like uh, solely on our own, travel around, find a way there to get the things covered, to get. Uh, I think at then we are still using a semi conventional camera, which is film. So, when I was covering the family members who arrived at the site, it was a sunny day before they arrived. But the moment when the uh, Navy boat who brought them to the site, it started pouring. It was, if you can't tell, it's very strange. Right? It started pouring. It's like we don't know whether on their face are tears or rain water. So it was very shaky. And then we were like, I got to change my uh, so called 36 exposure film. And I can't change because it's like, I think it's raining. So I only got to keep the 36 to cover the shots while they're on the boat shouting to me, it's like, where are the body? Where are the body? That is the, that is the only words I can hear from them. So they want to know where is it because the river is so huge. Mm. So they want to know exactly where are their family members. Was yeah. Yeah, it is indeed very very heart wrenching when when you describe it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, you you had uh, a pretty long career uh, with the new paper mm -hmm. from um, 1988 to 2016, yeah. right? You mentioned. So what were some other incidents that you covered? What oh. are the, some other stories? Yeah. Okay, some of those like major disasters, right? The the Sichuan earthquake, uh, we flown up to do the aftermath story, uh, visit some of the hospital, the patient, the small little kids who lost the limb, leg. I mean, it's kind of sad to see a five, six years old kids like without the limb, without the leg kind. Although they survived, but it's kind of like uh, sad scenes, I should say. And the place where you go is like all the debris building all collapsed, school site is no longer a school site kind. So and other than this is like the, the tsunami. The tsunami was quite bad also because it's like you can see a little kid in the swimwear, but you know that that moment he was like enjoying himself at the pool site. But the next moment he's being swept to a swampy area. The body is floating in that area. So this are kind of sight set scene that we cover when doing this our like tragedies kind. And then another one would be the SARS, la, mm. which is like, uh, uh, at then I think SARS was like, uh, our editorial was being so called break into two teams. We are divided into two teams. Uh, one is at one building, another is at another area. So that we won't, one, if so that the one team get infection, the other team still carry on. We still have papers to publish. <laughs> <laughs> so back in those days, back in 2003, you yeah. were already doing the split team arrangement that yes, we are doing. Yes, yes. <laughs> and then we, got a, we are given a thermometer, we are given a N95 mask as when we go to cover any story, we are supposed to like bring it along with us. Yeah. So you, you did wear the N95 yeah, mask? Yeah, when, when we come to certain area, like the hospital area, we have to. But I think it's not like uh, now the COVID period where we need to put on masks. And then I think we are given a mask when we come to a certain area that maybe to protect ourselves, the, our company actually provide us all this. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Would you say that the um, MI185 incident was the most impactful one uh. for you throughout your career or were there any other equally impactful incidents that you recall? Okay, uh, yes, after so many years, like coming to 34, 35 years, uh, when Museum approached me, I said, the, all the memory actually start flowing in. And it was like kind of a dark year for our, uh, an unfortunate year for our airliner, because there was like two crash. One was a Trini pilot crash in uh, Rannong, Bukit area, and the uh, follow that uh, after a few months later, it was the, uh, the silk air. So it's quite bad for, I think, not only an airliner, but I think all Singaporeans. We never encountered this before, and this was like suddenly 
within the, that year there, two. And then, uh, yeah, sad like this. But I think all our, fam all our so called Singaporeans actually get together and we actually did well. Mm. Yeah. And my advice to all Singaporeans, all people, try to spend your time with your family members, I mean, your loved one, because you never know what will happen the next. Yeah, so. <laughs> All right, on that note, yeah, thank you very much, Ms. Chu. Yeah, thank you, thank yeah, you. And again, later on, we will have a Q&A segment where you will see Ms. Chu and Mr. Singh again. So I would highly encourage you, if you have any other burning questions, to please leave your questions in pigeonhole and we will attend to your questions shortly. All right, thank you, Ms. Chu. Thank you. So uh, Ms. Chu spoke about SARS. Let's take a look at some photographs that came from the SARS period. Yep. Yep. This is one of our personal favourites. I think some of the students, when they had to take their temperature um, twice a day, they became really fed up with um, the process, which remains important nonetheless. Yeah. Okay, right. And on the other side, again, SARS um, in 2003, temperature taking in process. Right. And then fast forward to 2020, when COVID-19 struck. And um, one of the most memorable incidents in Singapore back then was the hoarding in supermarkets. So um, we have uh, a photograph of a man who was um, checking out with 16 bags of rice in his trolley right, at Fair Price Hub. Right. And um, also we have some artifacts that have to do with COVID-19. And um, over here, we have a set of three masks that were sewn by 80-plus-year-old um, Madam Ng Swang Wee, right? And one was for her son, one was for her granddaughter, and there was one for her great-granddaughter as well. And there were also some innovations that came with COVID-19. For instance, this face shield that you see that is developed by ITE staff to help lecturers be more audible when they are speaking. So how this works is that this um, face shield has the design of a mellophone, right? So that it can increase the speaker's voice level when um, it is worn, right? And you also see the N95 mask as well as the all familiar thermometer and the temperature record book. And um, well, as for the thermometer and the temperature record book, it came from the days of SARS back in 2003. I think today, a lot of us will be more familiar with um, digital means of keeping our temperature records. Right, and so in this section, we also cover a lot more photographs on, uh, of COVID. And this comes as part of our Collecting Contemporary Initiative that is um, jointly uh, done together with NLB. Right, so you see here um, some of the, some of the for, uh, during the, the circuit breaker period, the National Museum commissioned some photographers to um, head out to the streets while, of course, um, observing all the safe management measures. And they came back with these very um, evocative photographs that speak to us about what people from all walks of life experienced. Yep. And um, of course, there were the happier moments when Singaporeans came together and wrote notes of encouragement for our frontline workers. Right, and we also have here with us um, how life was like in the dormitories, right, with the foreign workers staying active while um, being in their dormitories. So this brings us to the conclusion section of our exhibition. So we call this conclusion section coming home. And what it, the form that it takes is really um, a huge projection. But before going to the huge projection, what we do is to encourage our visitors to respond to these prompt cards over here. So there are three questions, right? Um, a question of what is home to you, a question of what is most precious to you about Singapore that we should preserve for the future. And another question about what is one area that we should work on that will make Singapore a better home for all of us. Right, and we encourage our visitors to then fill in all these cards and then to scan them into the projection. So with the help of all these huge scanners, 
right, visitors will be able to scan in their cards and it will appear on the projection that you see. And what happens after um, putting in the projection, right, scanning in the cards? The words will be immediately recognized and they will join this map that you see on the left. This is a map of Singapore, but it is also made up of the 100 most frequently used words that came from the visitors' uh, prompt cards. All right. So, um, well, you would have been able to see some of the nicer, some of the cards which are really nice, right? So, um, just to show you one more that is interesting. Right, home is about peace where we can wake up at 7 a.m., 1 o'clock, and look out into the rising sun to feel serenity. Right, so we really enjoy looking at all the cards. Sometimes uh, there, are one, uh, there are really beautiful illustrations. Sometimes there are very poetic illustrations as well. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the exhibition. But um, just let me just um, highlight another feature of our exhibition. You would have noticed by now that as I was walking through the gallery, there were a lot of these yellow strips on the floor. So these yellow strips, they are tactile strips that we have put in intentionally for our, visitor, uh, for our visually impaired visitors to come into the exhibition and to navigate their way around. So this was really a curatorial challenge that was given to us. Um, someone asked us, our exhibition is so visually heavy. There are many photographs, many artifacts, quite a lot of text that we are showing. So what happens for a visually impaired visitor then? So because of this um, question, we decided to develop uh, a tour right, for our visually impaired visitors. And so we have a smart cane prototype that is um, developed in collaboration with Nanyang Polytechnic as well as Guide Dog Singapore. Right? And um, this smart cane comes with a specially curated audio tour with navigational instructions. And the strips come in very handy because the smart cane will be able to roll over these tactile strips and help our visitors to stay on track when they hear um, the bumps that are made. All right, so at the end of the exhibition, this is where please be reminded to tap out using your RFID tag. Right? And you will be able to see the results of what home means to you. Right? Uh, be it places, people, or experiences. All right, so as promised, right, we do have a Q&A right, segment at the end of this exhibition. So now we will head out of the gallery and join Mr. Singh and Ms. Chu again. So now let us um, go to Pigeonhole and take a look at some of the questions that have come in from the public. Okay, so um, there are two questions that are addressed to uh, Mr. Singh. Right, yes. so um, this first question here. Mr. Singh, hi Mr. Singh, were you involved in any National Day parades? And could you tell us more about your experiences in these National Day parades? Okay, I think my first National Day Parade was in 1970. Uh, I was in the Combat Engineers and we were marching in the front of our engineer contingent. And where just after the parade started, parade started, it started raining. So we were there in the parade with the rain going on and all. And then we had marched, had marched along North Bridge Road towards uh, Queenstown. And uh, what I recall most about that parade personally was I was wearing my turban, it was raining, and it was soaking up the water, rain water. And the turban was sl sliding down to almost covering my eyes. But there's nothing you could do, you see. So that was the, the thing. But what was good about that parade was that even the spectators and the VIPs who were there in the stands were there in the rain. So every one of us was like one group, all suffering the same thing, 
but standing and honoring the nation's birthday. All right, yeah, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Because I think for most of us, we are familiar with the 1968 NDP as yes. the one where it rained, but you told us about the 1970 NDP yes. where it also rained. That's right. Yeah, so um, perhaps more research and more documentation can be done for that. Yeah, yeah thank you. And the second question for you is, um, what was your proudest moment in the SAS? I think the proudest moment was when I got my commission as an officer. Uh, my father and mother were there, and uh, it was like, I, I wasn't that good a student in school. I was just getting to buy in school and all that. And to my parents, the fact that I became an officer, they, they were very proud of me. And seeing them being so proud really made me feel proud. And I think that was one of the other motivations I had of wanting to continue uh, in the SL because I think I did my national service well, and I think that sort of suited me as a career. Yeah, yeah. I think the experience that you shared probably also resonates with quite a lot of young men and national service men. I, I see yeah. a lot of photographs of all these NS men. So so well dressed, looking so dashing in their uniform and their proud parents just next to them. So I think it Correct. really makes a difference. Yes, yeah. It does. <laughs> All right. And so, um, Ms. Chu, right, there is a question for you. <laughs> After covering so many um, natural disasters, right, do you feel traumatized? And how do you then deal with that? Uh, I think we just take it quite easily. Although, yes, you're the Sometimes the memory has keep coming back to you, but I think usually we have to be very positive. Our job is like to cover the news, bring back the story for the readers, and we just got to close the chapter as it is. Because you cannot just bring whatever like the sorrow or word to another job. So every day, news is every day is a new thing. So it's a new chapter every day, so I should say. Yeah. All right. Um, out of curiosity, right? Mm. Was it part of your portfolio that you usually covered um, incidents of this nature? Were there any <laughs> happier stories that you covered? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, one of the ma some of the major are because it happened that uh, my supervisor was asked me to hey, go and send us out to cover because maybe for ladies, maybe it's more like a touch when you approach the so-called the new newsmaker. So I do have some uh, very like um, enjoy or memorable one. Like sometimes you get a superstar like Jackie Chan sitting in a bathtub, doing his his so-called uh, uh, underwear kind of like washing for you, take a pictures, and we sort of meet some meet up with some uh, stars like a uh, soccer player, those like UK players. We like, other people have like kind of difficult of uh, uh, like face to face kind of like contact, but we do have a chance to meet up with some of this superstar, yeah. <laughs> right, I think that leads naturally to the next question that is also for you. Uh -huh. Yeah, can you share interesting facts about being a photojournalist over the years? Okay, uh, being a photojournalist, news media coverage is, uh, as I just said, that every day is a new thing. You're looking forward for a new chapter every day. So once we cover that particular news, it's like, but it's good that we don't have, we don't have much homework to do because we don't have it's every day is a new thing. So you're meeting new people, new situation, new environment. Uh, every day is a new day. So uh, your timing is you enjoy and you pass very quickly, by like day by day kind. Yeah, but it's a place where you sort of learn a lot of stuff at new kind. Yeah. So I enjoy because it's like. Every day is a new day, so you don't get bored. <laughs> yeah, there's never a dull moment. Yeah, correct. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Oh, okay. It looks like um, the rest of the questions have to do more with um, the curator. <laughs> right. <laughs> so what <laughs> was the biggest challenge curating the special exhibition? There were many challenges, many big scale challenges. <laughs> yeah. But, um, I mean, just to list, uh, yeah, I mean, a, a number of challenges really cropped up because this was conceptualized during the time of COVID, right? So our, that meant quite a number of changes to our um, timeline. 
And at the same time, because um, we knew that COVID was definitely going to impact the museum visitorship, that's why we came up with a digital experience to the exhibition as well. So if you have not seen our digital experience, please check it out. Right? It is called at, you know, the sign at home truly. Right? And it is um, hosted on roots.sg, which is NHB's website. In this digital experience, we roll out chapters. So they are stories and um, it is based on a grandparent and, um, and his grandchild and how they interacted during the circuit breaker as well as more recently during the phase two heightened alert. So what we are really trying to do is to, you know, spin a story, but to have historical artifacts as well as um, historical facts to back up this story. Yeah. And so um, in, in the digital experience, we cover themes like National Day uh, and, and also um, various festivals. And um, each of the chapter also feature new original illustrations by local artists. Yeah. So, um, I mean, we, we do have various challenges, but um, that has also given us a chance to innovate. And so that, that was an interesting process in um, coming up with the exhibition. All right, and okay, there's another question for me, and then the next question is again for Mr. Singh. So hold on, uh, let me answer one more question. <laughs> oh, this one, yeah, we often get this question. What do you do with the data collected from the cars? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I mean, when you go into the exhibition, right, you will be registering um, the RFID tag as well. So we often get another question of what do we do with the RFID data? So please be re rest assured that the data is um, secure with us, right? And what we are trying to do is really some analytics of um, what our visitors are interested in, how they respond to the stories, how they respond to um, the RFID uh, stations that we have, right? Some of which feature quotes. And so by understanding which are the stories, uh, the types of stories and themes that resonate with our visitors, we are able to then come up with more relevant exhibitions uh, and as for the cards, right, so um, we, some of them are already digitized, right? So those on, on the projection, they are digitized already. And we also look forward to, um, to keep a record of these prom cards. Yep. Um, namely, because they do tell us what the visitors think about the exhibition. And they capture very real responses, right? Um, I mean, I showed you some cards during the tour. So you'll be able to get a sense of the kind of um, precious, memories uh, and, and reflection that we gain from our visitors. And we are very thankful for that. It's very authentic sharing. And we witness how um, these prom cards, as well as um, the tuck shop segment that I showed, right? It encourages intergenerational bonding. Yeah. So perhaps we'll be looking at more spaces like this where visitors can, can stop, take a break, and just talk and reflect on their experience at the exhibition. All right, as promised, next question, Mr. Singh. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, can you share how training for combat engineers has changed over the years? Wow. Oh, interesting question. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I think it's changed dramatically. Uh, when we first started, combat engineers was very manpower intensive. Uh, we build bridges, you actually have to carry the parts. And for example, we started off with the Bailey Bridge. Uh, one of those panels, uh, which you actually put as upright support uh, is about 600 pounds and six of us carry it. So you have to got a, got a wooden handle, two on either side, so three by three, you know, six percent, uh, you carry it and you carry this. So that was basically the manner in which you construct. A bridge construction normally will take a day to a day and a half. Manually you have to do it. And then when you finish training, it doesn't end with the building, you must dismantle the bridge because it's something that's reusable and you use it for the training site. So it's double work. So whereas if you're in the infantry, you just do things one time, you finish and you pack up and you go home. We have to bring everything back, stores, pack them up before you end the day. Today it's all mechanized. The technology, your bridges are remotely controlled. From a panel, you can actually launch a bridge. You know, what used to take 30 men to build over one whole day now takes maybe a four-man crew to do it in 15 minutes, 20 minutes. So there's a lot of changes and engineers are a lot more dynamic. Uh, if you go back in terms of injuries, my generation of engineers 
all of them have back problems because of the heavy lifting and all. Today is much more enjoyable doing what is being done. And uh, we go back and talk to the current people, you know, and we, sh we share our stories and they appreciate what we went through and we envy what they are going through, you know. Right, right. Thanks for that. Yeah, yeah. I think we, we often hear about how um, previous generations of NS men are quite envious of yes. <laughs> current generations. And, and we are, I mean, indeed, we are grateful for the, for the technological innovations yes. that make life easier, yes. right? Yeah. Correct. Okay. I, I suppose they have their own challenges now. Definitely. So there's differences in the challenges, but I think challenges will always be faced by people as they go through this. And even in our future generations, I don't know what form national service will take, but there will be challenges that people will face. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And uh, Ms. Chu, so um, which story that you have covered in your career has impacted you the most? I think every photo set or the stories that actually is equally memorable because every picture will tell you a story. And okay, what we just see may be a fi finishing of the product. But behind the scene, there's a lot of like, hard work behind. A long way, or how you capture the shot, and whether you get threatened by the newsmaker or whatever. So sometimes uh, we want to grab the pictures, uh, but safety also need to be careful also. And then sometimes we cover certain like wake, funeral wake. We want the pictures of people crying, but we have to be extra sensitive amounts like are we going to put our cameras direct to their face or what? So these are the things that is like, we want the shot, but at the other hand, we have to be careful, be sensitive with them and be with the family kind. So uh, every picture, seriously, you, if you ask me to choose, I think it's equally memorable and uh, it's like, there's, you will tell, you will tell every, every picture will give you a, a, a score, a story behind it. Yeah, and I think during our coverage, like, although we are all under like FPH, we have new paper, Berita Haran, Chao Pao, Shimi Wan Pao, so many papers, so many sister papers around with us. But we still have competitions. So if we manage to get a shot that other people don't get it, we usually use the word scoop. We scoop somebody else. So it's a satisfactory that you have that, oh, I got a picture for my papers and for the readers, and we like, we feel proud of our own coverage. Even though it's like a very simple shot, but where nobody will get it, but you are the only one. Just like when we cover the silk air crash, there was one picture that I took a, a picture of the family arrived at the site. So these are the pictures that I'm the one and only there. Whatever we, we send the other newspaper around, but they didn't manage to get that shot. So when the pictures were taken, you're like, one of the shots that, and uh, your editor actually use it as a, like a front and back page. We call it wrap around kind. And had, you hardly see this kind of pages. Yeah, unless for major events, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, since Home Truly, right, um, mm. it, it does cover quite a number of photographs. So this question um, directed to you is uh, more technical, mm -hmm. right? It has to do with photography. So uh, the question is um, what are your tips on taking photographs? And if I could add on to the question, right, what constitutes a good photograph? And therefore, what are your tips for taking photographs? <laughs> <laughs> As I was sharing with you earlier on, it's like, I think uh, news pictures coverage is more like 70% is actually luck. The thing is happening in front of you. And 30%, if you have a skill, yes, you do the shoot. And you must be fast and react fast. Uh, but if you doesn't have the, you have the skill and there's no luck beside you, there's nothing happens, you're like, you get nothing. So, uh, but when it comes to a certain shots, like when you need to react quick and fast, and whether you think that, eh, that is a, a newsworthy picture or not. So, for news, it's like you want to bring back pictures to tell your readers from a picture straight away, you know, they can tell what's happening. Then come to the headline, come to the text. So usually, the, it's the pictures that captured your eyes first. Yeah, before you go into the text. So I think it be quick, reaction, and also observant. Because 
every time when we tell, tell the photographer, we are like, for normal people, we just look straight. For photographer, we're not only looking 180, but we also 360. We use our ears to look behind, hear behind. Because sometimes there's things behind that happen that for normal people, you may just focus in front. You never know what's happened behind. So maybe some interesting behind you. So just be more observant on your surrounding. Yeah. Right, and as I was just thinking about it, your career would have spent the time when there was a change from analog cameras to digital cameras, yes. right? So did that make your life easier or how oh. do you deal with the change? <laughs> well, definitely, definitely. That's like, um, last time we started with the, like, the FM2, F3, which is a conventional and it's many focus. So imagine when you cover a soccer match, you got to chase after the ball. And it's like, it's not easy. It's not like the person is standing there. Okay, stay put, you focus, snap the shot. You have to focus using your hands to, uh, and then uh, it's, it's difficult. Unlike it's like, like nowadays, it's like every pictures you open up, you blur, you delete away. Well, not good, you delete away. But there's no, that a convention camera, you don't allow you to do that. So every shot you shoot, you're just wondering whether, do I get a shot? Do I get the ball? Do I get the, uh, the pictures, uh, uh, the, the soccer ball, the basketball in the pictures not? Because without the ball, the pictures is gone. It's like, it's not a perfect pictures. So, uh, I think it makes, I mean the autofocus and then the digital make your life much easier. And even like for uh, transmission of pictures. Back then, during when I cover in the 90s, when we, we need to carry uh, heavy equipment like a, a transmitter, like we call a, a, like a fax machine, to transfer pictures over from overseas back to Singapore. So at then it was like, it's not digital, like you scan in or you download and you can straight away WhatsApp you or digital. No way, you have to, for us it's a negative, you need to get a negative process, scan the negative into the machine, send it back. And if it's a color key, you have to send at least four key, CMYK, to send it. And if your the operator didn't know that you're on that line transmitting like for the 20 minutes, if they search or like, hello to you, that's it, you got to resend again. Because there will be a line on the picture, so you cannot use at all. So you got to make sure telephone line is good, and sometimes we have to react as a telephone uh, technicians. You got to dismantle the hotel lines to get it connect to our so-called using a crocodile clip to clip on the two lines and to transmit. Because there's some of the places that is not like those simple slot in kind of plug. It's like a two pin. So you have to be a technician, how to connect the line, how to get the line through and get the picture sent over. No point for you to like cover a nice picture and you're not able to send the pictures over. And sometimes when you go to those really uh, so-called village uh, uh, hotels that there's no lines. And sometimes the hotels only have two main lines, one for everybody to use, one for fax. So you have to sort of ask them, allow you to use some direct line, fax line. So these are the, some of the difficult parts for, for us. After taking a picture, you must send it back home. <laughs> yeah, indeed, it's not no point taking. <laughs> yeah, 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 because you can take a nice picture, but you know, there's no way for you to send back home. Your reader won't be able to get the pictures. It's not like you can fax those pictures over. For story, you can fax. I read to the editor and, and that get them right. But for pictures, you have to transmit back. So unlike nowadays, like, you just take a phone and just send straight away. The next minutes, you can get the pictures. But the last time, it's like uh, the challenge is also sending pictures back home. <laughs> All right, thanks very much for sharing, Ms. Chu. Yeah. Yeah, um, well, we are about time. <laughs> yeah, and so um, I think on behalf of our viewers, right, we would really love to thank both of you for joining us on this curator tour. I think you really told us a lot of insider information that we would have no idea about unless we are in the same field as you, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah, Mr. Singh sharing about how it was like in the NDP and how it was like being, um, well, the first person to be um, in the line for the registration for the first batch of NS men in 1967. <laughs> yeah. And um, also for, for Ms. Chu to tell us more about what it means to be a photojournalist, right? The kind of heart-wrenching and the emotions that you have to deal with 
while at the same time keeping your professionalism and ensuring that the job is done, connecting wires for that. <laughs> yeah. So we, we really thank the both of you for joining us on this curator tour and also to thank you for the contributions that you have done, Mr Singh, in protecting the nation and Ms Chu for making information uh, available for all of us. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank and you. so, um, as the last few words, right, uh, we'd like to again encourage all of you to join us at the National Museum. Do come down to the physical exhibition of Home Truly, which is ending really soon on 3rd of October. We are open daily from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. The last admission is at 6.30, so please come before that. And do adhere to the latest safe management measures. Yep. We thank you so much for tuning in with us, yep. and we hope that you have a good weekend. Bye-bye.